Good morning. Teaching and being taught spiritually must be understood from this basis, because this is the key to the entire situation. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. The natural man knoweth not the things of God, and indeed he cannot know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Therefore they can never be known through or by the human mind, nor can they be taught by the human mind or through the human mind, and therefore only an individual who has attained some measure of that mind that was in Christ Jesus, the ability to spiritually discern, can teach spiritually. And their teaching ultimates in lifting up the consciousness of the individual or raising the Son of God in the individual or developing that spiritual discernment in the student. Now, it is never what it appears to be, the imparting of knowledge, because, as we so well know, if you had all of the knowledge of truth that is in all of these books, you would still find yourself without spiritual power. Unless, in the study or reading of these books, that spiritual discernment had been developed. Now, <clears throat> Since spiritual truth is the very opposite of what you would call common sense, since spiritual truth is the very opposite of all that is intelligent in the human world, you can see that imparting spiritual wisdom is difficult and if not clearly understood becomes impossible. What must be understood? The first thing that must be understood is what you're trying to accomplish and what you are trying to accomplish is to educate the human mind out of itself. Let us see what we mean by that. The human mind is formed of certain laws, theories, convictions, that has been inherent in the human mind for generations upon generations and which we inherit on birth. And one of these is good and evil. Now every human mind is convinced of good and of evil. And as a general rule, it even decides what is good and what is evil, but to show you that actually 
it isn't making anything good or evil. The thing that is good in one place is evil in another, and the thing that is evil in one place can be good in another. The thing that is evil to one person can be good to another, and so forth. You may have a whole beautiful garden of roses, which to you are just magnificent. God's perfect uh, image. And the next person comes along and gets sick from being in that garden with the roses. Uh, to you, animals, cats and dogs, may be just the most loving creatures of God. And the next person sneezes all day and all night in their presence and is made miserable. And so to one, the dog and the cat becomes evil, and to the other, it's good. And to one, the roses are magnificent, and to the other, they're to be avoided. Actually, you can go through the entire human scale of belief, summing up in your mind what in your environment is called good and what in your society is called evil, and then look upon some of the other societies in the world and see if they agree on that. And eventually you come to the realization that nothing is good or evil except thinking makes it so, except uh, our acceptance or reaction to it. We probably would never want to get uh, anywhere near the inside of a lion's cage, and yet the lion tamers go in there seemingly without any fear. There is a lady in Long Beach who has the most wonderful collection of reptiles in the world. And she's uh, at home with them, and no one else dare go near them because they still have their poisonous fangs. But they do not disturb her. Oh, I, I could leave you safely for an hour or two to rehearse in your mind those things that you have automatically accepted as good, and those things that you have automatically accepted as evil, and then see if you cannot bring yourself to the realization how nonsensical. It depends on one's reaction. It depends on where one was born or how one was brought up. There are people fearing an invisible Satan. There are people fearing a, uh, a church. There are loads of people in the world still fearing Hebrews and still fearing Catholics and still fearing uh, whatnots. Therefore, oh, of course, you know... <clears throat> that in our strictly moral society, how many things there are that are shockingly bad and that others have discovered to be not quite so bad. Therefore, the spiritual teacher must first of all have come to the consciousness that there is nothing out here, good or evil, in and of itself, regardless of appearances. It is the reaction to it that makes it so. And I will illustrate that in uh, spiritual healing work. Someone uh, asks for help for some illness or other. And the human mind, from the medical standpoint, ah, this is evil. We must first give it, oh, quickly give it this medicine, quickly give it this shot, quickly give it this application, so forth. But your spiritual practitioner, if they are to succeed in healing, must already have arisen at the state of consciousness which recognizes that nothing is evil. 
Only a reaction to it makes it so. Only a belief in it makes it so. As, for instance, this theory of catching cold by sitting in a draft or getting wet feet, which now is no longer a law, but which for so many generations was a law that brought about colds. Or the old days of uh, menopause as having produced insanity. And now all of a sudden, it doesn't. In other words, in those days, the spiritual practitioner would have said it doesn't. That nothing is evil and nothing has a, is a cause of evil and nothing is an effect of evil and would have healed it. But now it doesn't need healing because nobody accepts it as a cause, as evil. Do you see that? Menopause is accepted as a physiological change and sometimes disturbing, sometimes creating a little nervousness, but not evil. And therefore, nobody fearing it, uh, nobody is uh, institutionalized because of it. Therefore, your spiritual teacher, to be a spiritual teacher, must have arrived, not at this knowledge having read it in books, must have arrived at the consciousness that enables it to sit down in the presence of these evil appearances in the realization that nothing is evil. Only the human belief would accept it so, but that can't make it so. Well, when your spiritual teacher has arrived at that consciousness, then you know that teaching spiritually means bringing your student to that state of consciousness. It means not merely imparting some wisdom to them or knowledge, but through the imparting of this letter of truth lifting them in consciousness to where they too can sit down in the presence of uh, the lion and say the lamb and the lion shall lie down together because they are both of the nature of God and actually bring about that demonstration. And the way they bring it about is they may not bring it about with lambs and lions out there but you'd be surprised how many times they bring it about between uh, husbands and wives where the husband is a lion and the wife is a lamb or vice versa and where they do bring about the harmonious living together do you see now the human mind then is actually a state of belief in two powers and only as your spiritual teacher can through these precepts and examples educate the student out of this belief in two powers does the human mind of the student relax and release itself and become receptive to the things of God, which, when they reveal themselves, usually say, Fear not, I am with you. Well, in the same way, then, the action of the human mind <clears throat> is to sit in judgment. And you cannot attain Christ consciousness until the human mind has relinquished that. Judge not. Judge righteous judgment. And therefore, as long as the human mind retains 
the desire, the will, the wish, to judge. It is the human mind. It is not receptive to the things of God. Only when the human mind can relinquish judgment and say, Father, reveal this. Father, reveal the nature of this. Then, you see, the human mind is not sitting in judgment. It is not calling this good and this evil. It is not calling this moral and this immoral. It is not calling this honest and this dishonest. It is not calling this uh, free and this slave. It is relinquishing. Eventually, you must completely relinquish judgment. Who made me a judge over you? Who made me a judge over you? Neither do I condemn thee. Neither do I judge thee. Neither do I hold thee in bondage to my sense of right or wrong. Ah! You would be surprised what happens as even a measure of this takes place in consciousness. When uh, that much of the human mind begins to d disappear from you, that you are constantly looking out and enjoying the is, and not judging by appearances. Whatever it is that I am looking at, whoever it is that I am looking at, I am not saying good, I am not saying evil, I am saying is. What it is, or what thou art, I may not know. But I do know that it is, I do know that thou art. And then I will let the Father, spiritual discernment, reveal to me who thou art, and in the end it will say, Knowest thou not, this is my beloved Son. But it will not only say that of Jesus the Christ. It will say that of the true identity of every individual. And of a partially attained Son of God in every seeker. Who is really seeking and knowing what they're seeking. Now, the student does not know what they're seeking, and they have no way of knowing. And if they read it in a book, they wouldn't recognize it. It would not make sense to them. Not a bit of it. Only the teacher, who, and the student, of course, who is on the path, even though they have not yet attained, they do recognize, ah, yes, that's what I'm seeking. Now I know how much further I have to go. No wonder Paul said I have not fully attained. But at least I do know that as far as I am concerned, I must relinquish this belief in two powers. Just as I must relinquish that there is a good and an evil anything, so I must relinquish that there is a good power and an evil power, or else I will be making the lifelong mistake of the churches. I will be seeking a God power to do something to evil. And they have never succeeded because there is no God power to do anything to evil. In the presence of God power, there is no evil. Now, there has been a change in uh, language in these last few weeks in the message of the infinite way. <clears throat> in that, 
I have more clearly perceived myself that we were too prone to merely say there is no evil, there is no sin, there is no death, there is no lack, there is no power in evil, when as a matter of fact this was only a half a truth. As long as we are in the three-dimensional mind, the human mind, there is lots of good and lots of evil. just as there is light in the daytime and darkness at night. It is only in the presence of illumined consciousness that evil isn't evil. You cannot rightly say that disease has no power, but you can say that in the presence of the Christ consciousness, disease has no power. You cannot say that sin or false appetite has no power when the whole world is suffering from them. But you can say that in the presence of a human consciousness, evil doesn't exist. So that as we now approach the idea of There is neither good nor evil. Let us always add to that the the last half of the sentence. In the presence of my consciousness, there is fulfillment. In thy presence is fulfillment. Not just there is fulfillment. In thy presence there is fulfillment. In my presence, in the presence of whatever state of illumination I have attained, is fulfillment. Not because of me, but because of the state of consciousness that realizes one power, the state of consciousness that realizes that that, uh, out here, in effect, there is neither good nor evil. Then, finally, we come to the last stand of the human mind. This is its last ditch fight. If you can master this, you are home. Until you master it, you are on the way. Or in proportion as you can master it, you are reaching home. And that is the law of self preservation. The law that would compel us to save our lives at someone else's expense. The law that would say, let us throw the bomb first because it'll save our lives. Or the law that even though the legal law says you you may shoot a burglar in your home, but the consciousness that would say no, no. First place, I'm not holding that individual's life as uh, less valuable than my property, and I'm not even holding it as even less valuable than mine, because even as we have witnessed the Magdalene becoming the greatest of the Christ followers, how do we know what burglar may someday become another Christ? Therefore, we can't sit in judgment and say your life is worthless in comparison to mine. But it is not you, it is not I, who uh, believe in this law of self-preservation. It is the human mind, the carnal mind, which is entirely built up of the word I. I, me, and mine constitutes the human world. I can do anything for me or for mine. 
Well, you can see that in proportion as you can relinquish this self-preservation, you would, while you are providing for the support of your family, you would also begin to see, oh, wait a minute, this isn't right unless I'm at least in a measure contributing to some other family that may temporarily not be in this. Or, as you are providing for the education of your children. Uh, now, this is not right unless I am also at least contributing in some way to my neighbors. In other words, the ultimate of this is love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbor as if thy neighbor were thyself. and then see that the human mind is not functioning. Because the human mind could never feel that way. The human mind is interested only in me and my children. Or it is only interested in me and my country. My country, right or wrong. This is the human mind, right? But love thy neighbor as thyself and pray for thy enemies, this is the Christ mind. And now you can see why the human mind could never accept spiritual truth. Well, <clears throat> these, or yes, these are three aspects of the human mind out of which every student must be educated in some measure before there is enough of the Christ mind there to enable them to receive the things of God, to understand, to know the things of God. Because you can't know two things. You can't know I, me, and mine, and thou. So one must give way to the other. Then, in working with the letter of truth, the spiritual teacher must know that these are three aspects of the human mind out of which the student must be educated. But the teacher, first of all, must have themselves been educated out of those three phases of the human mind to some extent, so that uh, they are themselves looking out without judgment. Without judgment doesn't mean without the ability to correct, because uh, always <clears throat> As we are presented with the human mind, we see its aspects, and we must correct the student. That is not sitting in judgment on them, correcting them. It is sitting in judgment on them to condemn them for it, or blame them for it, or hold them responsible for it, but to understand that each one of us is presenting aspects of the human mind and that in teaching our function as a teacher is to point these out and uh, bring about ways of correcting them. So the teacher then brings out these three aspects and all of the illustrations that will uh, <clears throat> help to dissolve the human mind. Now, heretofore, we have relied principally on the reading of books and uh, attending of classes or hearing of tapes, and leading a student up to this point through these means is very well. 
and a necessary step. But out of all of the students who uh, are studying in this manner, there will be found those who wish to go higher, who wish greater light, greater spiritual attainments. And then here is where we come to another phase of teaching and one that comes down to us from the most ancient of days when there were wisdom schools and this was the manner of teaching them. It is where a principle is given to the student for that student to practice and live with until realization dawns so that they may say on this point at least whereas before I was blind now I see for instance <clears throat> we have had given to us in these last few weeks the statement thy grace is my sufficiency in all things and there is a sufficiency of thy grace omnipresent for the need of this moment. Now this is a spiritual principle. It is a truth that is not true in the human picture. Because to the human being God's grace is not a sufficiency and nor is there a sufficiency of it present. Therefore it is only to the illumined consciousness that thy grace is my sufficiency and that there is a sufficiency omnipresent. Therefore, <coughs> the teacher gives this principle to the student. And the student has to live with it and practice it until some measure of fruitage is evident from the abiding with that principle. Why? Because the measure of fruitage is the measure in which that degree of humanhood has been lost that needed something other than grace or that felt that there wasn't a sufficiency at hand. Or this. As we understand charity and benevolence in the world today, <clears throat> we should embody these for the sake of the poor, for the sake of the downtrodden, for the sake of those who have not. But you see, this has made it very difficult for a sufficiency of charity and benevolence to uh, go forth into the world because it's so hard to make me uh, come to the conclusion that I really should give up so much of my own even for the poor and the downtrodden. Again, you see, there is the phase of the human mind that is clinging to itself and its own. But unfortunately this time it is through miseducation. Because that is not really the purpose of being charitable or benevolent. Actually it has nothing to do with the poor or the downtrodden or the have-nots. Because those it says you will have with you always. In other words, no matter what you do, you don't benefit them. You tied them over a bad period. 
the reason for benevolence and charity is that inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me, to myself. In other words, thou art myself, and I am thyself. And there is no such thing as thyself and myself. The self of me is God. Therefore, the self of you must be God. And since there cannot be two gods, the same God, that is the self of me, is the self of you. And therefore, whatever it is that I do unto you, I am doing unto myself. Not unto you and not for you. And not out of pity for you. Not out of love for you. But out of love for myself. The one self. The Christ self. God. Therefore, I must embody this principle of one self. And I must learn that this one self appears as infinite form. And just as I would feed myself three times a day, or just as I would educate myself, or just as I would do this or that for myself, clothe myself or house myself, I must do this for myself in many forms. Because all are not awakened to their true identity, their self. And as long as they are in ignorance of their self, they will be poor. At some period or other, they will need help of one kind or another. But always, remember, I am doing it unto myself in many forms. Now, this is stated throughout the writings. But this is not teaching. Teaching is when you accept this as a principle and then start out to put it into practice until you have attained the consciousness, the actual feeling that I am thyself and thou art myself. It's a principle to be worked with. Now, this is how it was done in the ancient days. And that is why nobody went through class in a week or two. Class took seven years. And usually seven years of living right in the household with the teacher or right in the building with the teacher. So that not only the words of the teacher, but the consciousness of the teacher was being imparted. Well, that has become impractical because of uh, worldly conditions. But the teaching on that basis could still go on with those students who were sufficiently dedicated as to be willing to take a principle, live with it, work with it, until they embody it. Now, in the same way, you will notice in our new papers and tapes that Whereas our writings formally said that eventually you must come to the place of rising above words and thoughts. In fact, you must rise above the human mind. Now, these say, that that must be accomplished now, not ultimately. And it doesn't mean that everyone who reads these writings will accomplish it or even will want to. It only means that to those with whom these statements register that the time has come to reach the realm beyond words and thoughts 
beyond the human mind. Well, now just see. Regardless of what we have said this morning, up to this point, you can see that these words and thoughts would be meaningless unless you can embody them as consciousness. Therefore, the only use of these words and thoughts will be as reminders to you that you are rising above them to the consciousness of them. And that as you continue to remind yourself with words and thoughts that it's not the words and thoughts that are any power but that the reminding is the lifting you above them into the consciousness of them in the same way that <clears throat> as you approach healing work well let us take an absolutely impossible situation I don't mean one that isn't happening every day but I mean that one that seems impossible of solution uh, we have a call from a husband or wife of intolerable living conditions between them differences that just cannot be surmounted and the appeal is to you for help and of course the first thought that has to enter your mind is how can I enter somebody else's household and uh, tell them what's right or wrong? And if I could, would they have the ability, whoever's wrong, would they have the ability to give it up? No, no, no. They are too convinced of their rightness. So therefore, nothing that I could think or do of a human nature would ever be of any value. Therefore, let me sit down get at peace and see uh, what is revealed to me within and probably as you'd sit down a thought would come like well of course it's God's grace that meets every need and that there is a sufficiency of God's grace all right then I'll just be still and listen You're convinced that words and thoughts are of no power. You're convinced that no activity of the human mind is going to solve their problem. So therefore now you can listen. And even if you can only listen for 10 or 20 or 30 seconds, you've done that. You might have to do it uh, two or three or four times in the day. You might have to do it uh, tomorrow tomorrow. You may get worse reports the day after. But nothing can change the fact that God's grace alone is the sufficiency and that there is a sufficiency of God's grace now. Therefore, there can't be anything further to do than to sit down until God's grace is realized because God's grace is not a term in the Bible. God's grace is an actual... It's an actual thing. It's an actual essence. There is an actual essence that could be called God's grace. A transcendental essence. Something that you can't think, hear, taste, touch, or smell. But you can be aware of. That's the things of God that only it can only be known through spiritual discernment. Not through knowledge, not through the mind. But through spiritual discernment you can know that the transcendental presence is here, which is grace. Now, if that situation is to be met at all, it will be met that way. It may be met by restoring harmony between them, or it may be met by bringing about a separation. Because 
there is no law in any spiritual book that says any two people have to stay together. They may have come together for lots of human reasons other than that God brought them together. And if God didn't join them together, they can be put asunder. Because what God hath joined together, no man can put asunder. But let no one believe that all marriages have been arranged in heaven. And therefore, lots of marriages can be rendered asunder because God didn't form them to begin with. And therefore, the activity of the presence of the Christ can unify where there is love or it can separate and divide where that is the, the, the way of demonstration. Therefore, we cannot sit in judgment as to uh, whether our work was successful by the way it came out, except as what may ultimately reveal itself, as an illustration of what we had some years ago when a businessman <clears throat> owned a half interest in a business and wanted to sell it and ask for my help. And lots of people came to buy and lots of deals came very close to being fixed but in the end everyone fell through and nothing happened and the sale wasn't made and finally the man was convinced that my work wasn't effective and he had me stop. And uh, I guess it was a year later. Mm -hmm. He awakened one morning and said, why should I sell that? Why don't I buy my partner out? And he did, and that has become his most successful business activity. He is happiest now than he's ever been. He's, he's in a sense of completeness and fulfillment. And then he acknowledged, oh, I see, I couldn't ask you to sell my business, but to bring God into the situation, rightness into the situation, and it has come. You see that? So it is that we cannot sit in judgment even if somebody is blind and said I would like to see will you restore my sight you can't say yes you can say I can't work for your sight I can only work for the realization that God's grace is your sufficiency and you will have to be satisfied with God's grace Oh, no, no, I want my sight. Well, then, you'll have to get somebody else. Do you see that? Uh, that's a very difficult thing to do. Very. It's difficult for me to uh, write letters to people when they ask me to work for their supply and say, I'm sorry, I don't know how. It's just something foreign to me. I can uh, pray for you, realize God's grace for you, but I can't ask God to give you something when I'm already convinced that all that God hath, you already have, since I am the Father of one. Well, those who write and say, help me for supply, they must read my answer and say, I think this man is uh, sick. Do you see? And so it is, sometimes they write and ask me to sell property for them. I say, go to a real estate dealer. I'm not a real estate dealer. I cannot sell property for you. I can realize God's grace, but that may not sell your property. Now you see, the spiritual teacher cannot teach this unless they themselves have reached the state of consciousness that realizes this, and then they can only teach it in the degree that they know that they are educating the human mind out of itself, gradually getting the human mind to give up its reliance on its own powers of judgment, reliance on good and evil, reliance on money, reliance on princes and uh, powers. And of course, along with that comes the realization that there's no God power to do anything to evil, and so they cannot even seek a God power. We can only abide in none power. 
But your teacher cannot teach that unless they first know and then secondly have in some measure attained. Now, you will discover for yourself that in the measure that your human mind yields up that you are attaining powers of discernment. You are attaining the powers to know the things of God, to tabernacle with God, to commune with God, and never for a purpose other than the communion itself. Everything else is a grace which is added or comes forth from. All right, now... We have two principles, well, no, <clears throat> it's one principle. It's the principle of secrecy. You hear a lot about it in fraternal orders, but I don't know why you don't hear about it in religion when it is one of the master's greatest principles. When you pray... Pray that, pray not to be seen of men, now here's one of the greatest principles ever revealed on the face of the earth. One of the greatest powers on earth is the power of secrecy. And here is how it functions. And this is why the spiritual teacher must teach it as a principle and see to it that the serious student works with it until they attain it. And here it is. I and my father are one. And since I'm on the spiritual path, I'm looking to God alone for my experience, for my joys, for my successes, for my supply, for my happiness, for my home, for my health. I'm looking only to God for these. Now then, why should I make any of these your business? Why should I talk these over with you? Why should I tell you anything? Why should I uh, bring you into my prayers? Do they have anything to do with you? No. They have only to do with me and my relationship to God. Therefore, unless I still think that I want something from you, I will stay away and go into the inner sanctuary of my own being. And I will tabernacle with God. Now remember this, there is no God in holy temples, there is no God in holy mountains. The kingdom of God is within you. So if you are serious that you really are going to God for your good, for your life eternal, for your harmony, for your fulfillment, because in the presence of God is fulfillment, then you must learn to pray secretly. You must learn to enter the sanctuary, the temple of your own being. You can do it in a church if you like. But uh, most effective praying is done at home or in the automobile or out under a tree where you're not conscious of other people around you, where there's no self-consciousness where you can forget self and surroundings and get in there to the Father within. Now, I'm not going to God for anything. I'm going into the inner sanctuary of my own being to tabernacle with God, to commune with God, 
to realize my inner oneness with God. Because I know that I and the Father are one. I know that all the Father hath is mine. And I know that none of this is true in the human picture. I know it's only true if I can make the contact with him. It only becomes true if in my innermost being I can make that contact and live with it. Then scripture says, what the Father seeth in secret, he rewardeth openly. What he seeth in secret is shouted from the housetops. Ah, but only in one way, by demonstration. The world may say, by looking at me, well, he's pretty happy. The world may say he's successful. The world may say he's joyous, or so forth and so on. Uh, but that is the way God proclaims it to the world. And I proclaim nothing further than that. Not the how or the why or the wherefore. That is my secret business. Until someone comes and says, share your bread with me. And I say, do you mean it? Inner bread or are you looking for something outside? Whatever it is you have, I hunger for it. Good. I will teach. But again, it will only be between thou and me. This will be our secret. What I teach will not be the affairs of the outside world. And how I teach will not be the affairs of the outside world. And what you learn must not be the affairs of the outside world. This is your secret with God. Until there be someone. And so you see why it is that you can't even be a teacher until someone comes hungering for what you have. You can't be a healer until someone asks for what you have. Because you can't go out and tell this world they haven't got spiritual discernment. So if you could say, I have something to heal and I have something to teach, they wouldn't believe it. So you might as well be still until they come. Now, the principle is that in this secrecy and silence of my inner being, I and my Father become consciously one. The Father can announce itself to me. I can receive God. I can hear, feel, taste, touch, smell, whatever it may be be aware of. And this is all I need. Because that which is taking place within me becomes tangible in the outer world as effect, as the fulfillment. In this presence of God within me is fulfillment out here. Oh, we're turning over to the other side to complete this. Now, the teacher has already demonstrated that they have kept themselves away from the world in their prayers, that they have had their periods of inner communion, maybe for weeks, months, years, or decades, because we're all different. And they have attained this power of grace, this power of inner communion. And People who are opposed to their spiritual studies now are no longer opposed. Uh, people who didn't personally like them begin to like them or understand them. In other words, this inner communion begins to appear visibly tangible in uh, 
fulfillment. And yet, they never forsake the principle of secrecy. What takes place within them is their secret. And uh, they have no do-gooder complex. They lose all desire to save the world because they know the world cannot be saved. You cannot go out and give this to the human world. Therefore, it knows that my own shall come to me. Those of my own household will come to me. And the bread, the manna that I have received from heaven, I will gladly share. But I won't share it with the world, I'll tell you that. I won't go out and tell it to my lawyer, and my tax man, and my baker, and my plumber. No. And as I travel the world, I will not tell it to the hotel people where I stop. Even though they've known me for years and years and years, they still don't know what I do. Because, except in the rare cases where someone comes, huh? now, <clears throat> in teaching, the teacher will give this as a principle to the dedicated students, the real seeking students. I will say, now it is with you to develop the minutes and finally the hours of inner contemplation until you arrive at that period of inner response, telling no man what you're doing, not letting it be seen, not even your family. Wait till you're in your bedroom or wait till you're in your bathroom. Wait till you're somewhere. Or go to a public library. Go somewhere where you can be in a corner and do your praying in secrecy and uh, as fulfillment comes in the outer plane, don't explain it. Don't tell it. Keep the fingers on the lips. Secrecy is the greatest power in the world. And the only time that it is permitted, it is in imparting it. Because when I impart it to you, I am imparting it to myself. If I were to impart this to the human mind, I'd be hitting up against a brick wall that would bounce back at me like a ball would bounce back. But in imparting it to you, it doesn't bounce back. You brought yourself here. You were seeking not loaves and fishes, but bread, meat, wine, and water, and not of a physical nature. Then you have benevolence. Be sure that you do your benevolences not to be seen of men. Now, this doesn't mean that... Uh, you have to send anonymous cash to wherever you want. It doesn't quite mean that. You can send your check here, there, or the other place. But in doing it, <clears throat> ask that it uh, not be publicized on any lists or that it be credited to a friend. In other words, uh, make certain that... Uh, you have no desire at all that this world know about it, that your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Do you think? Then it's perfectly all right for the community fund to know that you're a generous giver or the Boy Scouts. Or the, that's all right what they know because they too are part of that that is uh, working for the same purpose that you are contributing. They're contributing in a different way. as long as they don't, and you don't make it a matter of the newspapers and the public acclaim. Praise that comes to you unsolicited is of a different thing. What the Master was warning against was the making of a public display. Now again, the principle is the same. 
What I give in benevolence, I am not giving to somebody out here. I am giving to the Christ of my own being. It's something that takes place within me. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me, and the Christ knows all. And above all, it would know hypocrisy. Therefore, the Master says, in praying publicly and in doing benevolences publicly, you gain the praise of men, but you lose God. In other words, you lose this that has taken place within you. Therefore, the teacher will teach students not only the value but the power of secrecy and eventually will be able to show them that everything that takes place within you secretly within becomes known without. Whereas if you advertise it, it never becomes known because it isn't even believed. In other words, if I walked up and down the whole world saying how happy I am, I don't think many people would believe it. See that? Because they're not inclined to believe words that come out of the mouth. But I think that they feel something in your attitude that says, is a contented person, or a happy person, a successful person, and so forth. Not that we need their praise, no. Once you have made contact with the spirit within, you really need nothing of man whose breath is in his nostril. Least of all is praise. Now, just think of this. Not only it is not known in the religious world, very few people know in the metaphysical world or spiritual world that secrecy is the greatest power on earth and that the inner communion with the Father in secret is the secret of outer harmony. And yet, that is now what we, in this infinite way, must impart. We must reveal. And not as if uh, giving you a class this morning, but if you were my student here, and I were teaching continuously, it would be my function to nag you, to keep at you, until you began enough periods of inner communion and secrecy, until I could see by your outer life that you had in some measure attained. So, with each of these other principles, it would be my function as a teacher to keep a close eye on you. If necessary, ask questions requiring truthful answers, always remembering that if a teacher lies to a student, they've lost their power. If a student lies to a teacher, they've lost their connection. This cannot be. Someday you will discover that there will be happy marriages on earth. I mean that these will be the rule rather than the exception. But I will also tell you when these will come. When? A man and a wife have no secrets from each other.
when they do not feel that they do something that they don't want their mate to know, when there is that complete openness of conduct and thought, there's no ground anymore because it establishes a relationship. Without words and without thoughts, it establishes a confidence, it establishes a something. Do you see that? Because you'd be surprised that in the intimacy that exists between two people in one household, that a lie or in the consciousness of one becomes a discord in uh, the relationship in the other. A distrust, a mistrust, a, a something. No one may know why in the household, but that's the reason. That it is an impossibility for two people, two partners in a business, to be other than completely open and frank. Otherwise, some discord enters. And the reason is that whatever is taking place secretly is known openly. And my secret relationship with my family is known to them openly, even if they don't know what I'm lying about. They know something is wrong. See that? Therefore, there must come a complete relationship which is based on oneness. Since I am thou and thou art me, how can there be anything of a secret nature? See? Then, as the teacher works with these students with these principles one by one not feeling that they can impart this to anyone in a week or two or three or four it, they can't because they can only take about one of these principles at a time and a student can hardly believe that they'll demonstrate them in a week or two but they can take a principle for a week or two and then another principle for a week or two and then have the both principles for a week or two and so on and so forth remembering always that everything comes to fruition in silence in secrecy say that If you should ever wonder why in 17 years we have less than a dozen teachers in the entire world, this will be the answer. That <clears throat> the message of the infinite way cannot be taught with the mind. A teacher must have come to some measure of demonstrated spiritual consciousness and the only way that anyone would know that they have is by the fruitage in other words if they were around me much I could tell it because I can feel their consciousness but otherwise, I can only tell it by what is happening in their experience. And if they are finding themselves with larger and larger and larger practices, healing practices, I know right well that in their consciousness, they are no longer sitting in judgment as to what's good and evil and what's good power and what's bad power. They've lost their fear of the world of effect. So I know they've attained because they could not be having the fruitage unless they had attained. And then as they are asked questions and I come in contact with their students who are well taught, and that's further evidence to that. It is for this reason, 
that from the beginning of the message of the infinite way, it was made clear to me that it must never be organized. Because once you organize, then you must have uh, an activity in Los Angeles and Chicago and New York and Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and San Francisco and so forth and so forth. But being unorganized, we don't have to have an, or, uh, a, an activity any place. I don't care if there's no activity any place on earth. Because I'm not organized. I'm not dependent on anybody's dues or contributions. Therefore, I don't care if there aren't any. My demonstration is that I and my father are one. And therefore, I must rely always on spiritual unfoldment for my income, my grace. Therefore, I could not allow myself to become dependent on establishing this, that, or the other thing. Well, the same place, the same way. The moment we would have a teacher that had not demonstrated their inner contact with the Father, we would have teachers looking for pupils and looking for classes and looking for fees. Then we would have no spiritual impartation. See that? Now, if the message of the infinite way is to function down through the ages, it will a in, in, it will in uh, it will function only through the consciousness of those who have attained this inner communion with the Father, the fruitage of which is divine grace. Then, it makes no difference how few there may be. Those few will take care of the world because no more of the world will be led to them than they can take care of. Now, the time has come for our teachers to present these specific principles, give the student the opportunity of working inwardly with these specific principles until they attain some measure of oneness with them. Then they will say, like the Master, I have overcome the world. Well, he hadn't overcome Caesar, he hadn't overcome the Sanhedrin, but he overcame both Caesar and uh, the Sanhedrin so far as his life was concerned. They could crucify them, cry, fire him, but they couldn't keep him in a tomb. They could shut his mouth, but they couldn't stop his word. And so, each one of us in a measure comes to where we have overcome the world, meaning the world cometh to me as temptation but findeth nothing in me. I can walk up and down a great big alley of uh, whiskey bottles and not feel the slightest temptation. I can walk right up and down a whole alley of... Uh, gambling tables and not feel the slightest <clears throat> temptation. Do you see what I mean? But what I really mean is that we can walk up and down a whole alley of sin and disease and lack and limitation and the threat of war and fear no evil. Because the temptation will be in the same nature as those whiskey bottles or those gaming tables there just be pictures out there that findeth nothing in me to respond to. And so eventually, sin, disease, death, 
lack limitation, are pictures out there that find nothing in me to respond to. In that measure, then, those who seek the grace of God will, in coming to me, be released from this world, from the human mind and its fears and its temptations and its two powers, so that we can rightly say that wherever Jesus walked, uh, sin evaporated, disease evaporated, lack evaporated. So we can say that wherever the spiritually illumined walk, sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation evaporate. Probably not so far as the masses are concerned, because they didn't evaporate in the experience of the Master. He did not many mighty works either in his hometown or in Jerusalem. But they evaporate wherever there is anyone trying to break through the throng. They evaporate wherever there is anyone sitting at the feet. And so teaching takes on another phase or facet in the message of the infinite way. You who are teachers and practitioners must see that you are this only by the grace of God. Be assured that your will, your wish, your desire will never make you a teacher or a practitioner. No amount of human longing will ever make you a teacher or a practitioner. The human longing may be an advance uh, inside information that that grace is going to come. But sometimes it is merely the ego that wants to be out front somewhere in the spotlight. So even when we have that desire, if we have it, we have to be very careful that it isn't the ego projecting itself. To me it is strange when I witness it because I myself never have had any desire to be a teacher or a practitioner. It never entered my mind to want to be one. and. Uh, it was only under difficulty that I was drawn into it. And as I see with most of our teachers, it's happened that way with them. They wanted to avoid it. They didn't want to be brought out of their inner contemplation. But eventually they were compelled to. Now, if you can see that Nothing on my part could ever have brought the message of the infinite way through me except the grace of God. Then you can take the next step and say, well then Joel doesn't have to worry about how it is to be uh, given to the world because whatever it is that is uh, pushing it through him is pushing it into consciousness and providing for it and carrying it around the world. Therefore, there's no personal responsibility on his shoulders except to watch his integrity every minute. Otherwise, uh, the rest, the spirit that produced the message will carry into human consciousness providing fulfillment at every level of its need. Ah, the moment you see that, you are set free. Because the grace of God that made you a teacher or practitioner is the power of fulfillment. So that you do not have to seek students or patients. The grace of God brings them 
to your doorstep in proportion to your readiness for them. You do not have to be concerned whether or not uh, you can afford this place or that place because the grace of God that is functioning through you is paying for it. You are the transfer agent for the rent or the food or the clothing or the housing. But the grace of God is the producer. Now, this can be applied in your practice to every circumstance that is brought to you. And for instance, I have here a letter from a committee of people who are seeking to build a hospital in a small town where there isn't an adequate one. And uh, their problem is uh, a million and a half of dollars, which you can understand to the human mind is presenting a problem. And my answer is just this. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me, the Christ. Therefore, whatever it is that you believe you are going to do for sick people, or poor people, or crippled people, you are doing unto the Christ. Therefore, this activity in which you are engaged must be an activity of the Christ because its object is to serve the least of these my brethren. And in that passage, the Master referred to the fact that when I was sick, ye comforted me, and when I was in prison, ye visited me, and when I was poor, ye fed me and clothed me. So therefore, this very activity that you are planning comes under that passage as a Christ activity. Therefore, the responsibility of paying for this hospital is not yours. You are the messengers, the transparencies, serving the Christ. You are the servants serving the Christ because on the human level of life today, hospitals are necessary. Mental institutes are necessary. Homes for the aged are necessary. Nursing homes are necessary. And uh, since they are, and since they are a service to the poor and the sick and the needy, they are a service unto the Christ. There probably will come a day when human consciousness is completely evangelized and there will be no sickness to heal and no poverty to patch up. And then Christ activity will be of an entirely different nature. But just as we are doing spiritual healing, which is a recognition of the fact that there are those under the belief of sin and sickness and lack, and we are serving it through our spiritual means, they are doing it, the same thing, to the same people through the highest means at their command. And that desire to give a modern hospital, a complete hospital, a perfect hospital, is as Christly as our desire to bring forth harmony through our means. Well, in the same way with a business problem, Every activity of a normal business is a service. It's serving the least of these my brethren in one capacity or another. And therefore every business that is conducted with the idea of integrity, service, honesty, is likewise a serving of the least of these my brethren. Therefore it is a Christ activity.
so that any problem that is brought to us, whether it's an unhappy household or an unhappy business or a failing business, or the desire to bring forth hospitals or institutions of one kind or another, all of these must be understood in the light of a service unto the least of these my brethren, therefore a service unto the Christ, and letting the Christ perform its functions through us. Then, as we learn to pray in secret, the way will be revealed to us in which monies may be raised, if it's necessary to raise them. Well, do you remember the story of the prodigal son who left his father's house And he used up all his substance, and he finally ends up eating with the swine, realizes that even his father's servants are better off than he is, and then starts to return to the father's house. Well, now I'll tell you something that never took place to an individual. That was not the experience of a man. The mystic who gave us this story was telling us the human mind left the father's house and has used up its substance and is turning back to the father's house. The human mind is the prodigal. The human mind is cut off from God. The human mind has no hidden manna, no meat that the world knows not of. The human mind is a prodigal. It has only what it knows it has, and each time it uses a little of it, it has that much less. And therefore, the prodigal is the universal human mind. And uh, it is now nearing the time when it is banqueting with swine, when it knows that it cannot rely on money, on treaties, on armies, on bombs. It cannot even rely on its crops. And pretty soon it's going to have nothing left to rely on. And then it will have to turn to the Father's house. And this can never be done one by one, because the next generation would be born and they would have to do it. So it can only be done as the human mind turns to spiritual resources, and then the new generation is born into that higher consciousness. And so only one generation has to become destitute. Only one generation has to come to the realization that with all my material things and powers, uh, I am nothing. I am less than a servant of God. Because a servant of God is always safe, always well. All was fed, all was housed, all was clothed. The servant of God lacks nothing. And so the hu whole human mind, with its storehouses of wealth and power, is less than a servant of God. And that will make it turn. That will bring about the reclothing with the purple robe and the jeweled ring so that individual consciousness will be divine consciousness.
Please note that a plane just went overhead and made that roaring noise, but uh, the message was so important, I would like you to hear through the noise rather than to try to do it over again. This will help you to see why it is that a message like the infinite way can bring about the complete spiritualization of consciousness of the world. Not because everybody in the world will become an infinite way student, but because every principle of the infinite way that is introduced into your consciousness is not being introduced into your consciousness alone, but into human consciousness. Every principle that has been released in our writings is not merely being released into the writings, into the consciousness of those who read them. They are being introduced into human consciousness. Just the same as when uh, something arouse, comes up in the news of a fearful nature, it makes even those people fear who have no knowledge of what's in the news. They just waken in the morning with a sense of fear. And they don't know why. They have absorbed it. And in the same way, there is no reason why the world cannot awaken one morning and realize its freedom. Because if you are communing secretly, silently, sacredly within your own consciousness, are you not communing in the consciousness of everybody in the world who is saying, oh, isn't there a problem, a solution to these problems? Oh, can't God help? What difference does it make whether they're turning to a Chinese God or a Hindu God or a Christian God or Jewish God? Those are only mortal concepts. What they really mean is God. Now, it is in proportion as truth enters consciousness that the entire world is being evangelized. And we see the beginning of this in this way, that the introduction of Christian science into human consciousness has not merely benefited Christian scientists. Loads of people have been set free from the fear of death just by no longer talking of death but of passing on. Loads of people have been benefited by the lack of fear in outer effects, germs and so forth. In other words, more people are benefiting in this world from the introduction of Christian science than they will ever acknowledge. I would like our teachers to start instructing the students in what you might call treatment without words or thoughts. That is, bring out in them the ability when a claim presents itself to recognize that now there's no human thought that would help the situation, nothing that I could think that would meet the situation, and therefore let me be still and know that I, in the midst of me, is God. Let me hear 
let me receive and then speak Lord thy servant heareth and wait if necessary only 10 seconds 15 seconds but to train the student to engage in more and more of that type of healing work that sits down and acknowledges that there is no human thought I could think, there is no truth I could know, because only the transcendental presence itself, the Christ itself, dissolves these appearances. Therefore I must sit here and become receptive to the Christ, and then listen. And it may last 10, 15, 20 seconds. The main thing is that the student practice this 10 times a day, 20 times a day, 30, whatever their own inner uh, impulsion is. And there's never any lack of subjects to treat because uh, there is the threat of world war. Uh, there is the threat of economic depression. There is the threat of uh, Asiatic flu. There is uh, the threat of uh, elections. There is uh, enough going on in family life, community life, national life, so that anyone can sit down a dozen times a day and say, how can this situation be met? Well, there's no human thought will meet it. If uh, truth books would do it, there's enough of those published. If just knowing the truth that's in books would do it, there's been enough truth knowing going on. So the next step is the transcendental experience itself. Because this is what the infinite way has been saying in every book. This is not a teaching. This is an experience. Experience. And whatever teaching there is, is merely to lead up to the experience. And now, we are in that era of the infinite way, when we must approach every problem from the standpoint that, now there's no human thought I can think and there's no truth I can know with the mind that is going to solve this, therefore... I must be about my father's business. I must be listening. I must know that I, in the midst of me, is God, and let it utter itself. Let the voice utter itself that the earth may melt. And therefore, I am developing receptivity. Well, you see, each one of us who is very actively engaged in healing work is working from that standpoint. We have reached the understanding that uh, my human thought is not God's thought. And God's thought is not my human thought. Therefore, my human thought is not power. Even when my human thought is uh, saying a lot of words of truth, it isn't power. There is a mind that is called the mind that was in Christ Jesus. That is higher consciousness. There is a higher consciousness. And when it is on the scene, the earth of error melts. Therefore, the meditation or prayer or treatment, which is to be effective, is to be one in which that transcendental mind is actually realized, felt. When I can feel it, when I can know then it is on the field, it is caring for the situation. And so we must be taking our more serious students into this higher consciousness, not teaching them about it, but bringing them to the actualization of it. 
In other words, it is as if you were to say, you the teacher, were to say, now look, I really should be able to turn out four or five or six fine teachers, a dozen practitioners, but how? Well, not unless I could uh, lift them to where they could actually realize that the activity of the human mind isn't going to heal, or knowing the truth with the human mind isn't going to heal. Therefore, if I am to be successful as a spiritual teacher, it is in my ability to lift them to that same realization of the tra transcendental presence as I have access to. So that, just as I am saying, I have meat, I have hidden manna, my function is to bring my student to where they can say the same. Then they can go out into the world and do likewise, just as Jesus, in sending out the disciples, must have uh, raised them to some measure of his consciousness, certainly not enough, but to some measure of it, or they couldn't have gone out. Now, you cannot do this teaching people truth. You can only do it when uh, they are willing to be taken up higher, lifted higher, by these specific practices. And uh, finally made to realize when we speak of the Christ, we're not speaking about a term in the Bible. We are speaking about an actual presence that is here and which is as tangible to us as your money in the bank is tangible to you. And until the Christ becomes that tangible to you as an experience, you do not have hidden manna. You do not have meat the world knows not of. You only have quotations about it. Now you must come to the experience. And that is the part that we are functioning in. Because the more of us there are with the experience, the more will be drawn to us. You know, when I went into 236 Huntington Avenue as a Christian science practitioner, I was the only practitioner in the building. And for about three years I remained the only one. And others just would not come in, because the feeling was that there wasn't enough pra practice for uh, more than one. In fact, before I went in, they didn't even think there was enough practice for one. But I did prove that there was, and they thought, well, then I must have all the practice. But gradually, after the third year, a second one, and a third, and a fourth, and when I left the building, there were over 60 practitioners in the building. Now, they may not all have been busy, successful ones, because a lot of people go in the practice that are not equipped for it. But those who were, were successful in that building because spirit multiplies. It doesn't divide. If I have a healing consciousness, it will draw unto me my own. But if I find somebody in Honolulu to share that practice with, it doesn't lessen my practice, it multiplies my practice. And then if that one finds somebody in Honolulu, it doesn't lessen their practice, it multiplies. Because what happens is, some of hers come to me, and some of mine goes to her, and some of his will come to both of us. And it'll keep on and keep on multiplying. Do you see? So the more spiritually illumined students we can turn out, the greater will be the activity of student seeking and patient seeking. Thank you.